Let's just give it one more minute. Okay, here we go. So welcome to the 2020 Aspen Center for Physics online colloquium today with Kim Boddy from Johns Hopkins University and University of Texas, Austin. I'm Katie Fries. I myself moved to UT Austin last year and I cannot be more, I could not be more excited that Kim is joining us in Austin. Of course, ironically, we're not in the same building, but at least we're on the same Zoom. So I, I also wanted to make the connection between today's lecture and the Aspen workshop that I'm, that we're, Kim and I are both co-organizers for, Dark Matter from the Laboratory to the Cosmos. So as you know, because of the pandemic, it's not happening this year, but we are gonna do it next year. So next summer, if you're interested, then see, see if you could make it to our, our workshop next summer. So we plan to share new physics in Aspen, but at least we can bring you some, some very exciting stuff here today. So new this year, the colloquia will be posted on YouTube at Aspen Physics, and you're invited to share this talk with your students and colleagues. The center is also hosting public lectures online on Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. Aspen time, 11.30 UTC, which you're invited to join. This week, James Colin Hill will speak on the Hubble conundrum. Now, since Kim's talk is only about 30 minutes, we won't interrupt her, but please raise your hand by clicking the hand at the bottom of your screen, and I'll call on you during the Q&A after Kim's talk. Also, because the talk is being recorded, you may appear in the recording. So if you don't want to be seen, then stop your video. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce Kim, who got her PhD at Caltech, followed by postdocs in Hawaii and Johns Hopkins, and as I already mentioned, is now starting at the University of Texas in Austin. So, her expertise is in the field of astroparticle physics, and she's been working particularly to understand the particle nature of dark matter. So she's had a lot of very interesting ideas for moving beyond the standard paradigm to study dark matter, matter interactions through their effects on the CMB, large scale structure, and dark matter halos. Today, the title of her talk is Understanding Dark Matter Throughout Cosmic History. Take it away, Kim. All right. Thank you very much, Katie, for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here and be a part of this uh, colloquium series so that um, even though we can't uh, meet in person in Aspen, um, at least I can share with you uh, a bit of the spirit of the workshop that uh, we had intended to hold this summer. Um, so the, um, as, as Katie mentioned, the, the workshop name was um, Dark Matter from the Laboratory to the Cosmos. So as you can imagine, this uh, topic spans a wide range of subfields within physics. Um, there are a lot of people contributing uh, to this effort, a lot of theorists and experiments, uh, experimentalists alike. Um, so it will be impossible for me to actually cover everything um, that has been going on in the dark matter field uh, to convey to you today. Um, but hopefully I will um, just uh, touch on some uh, interesting aspects that I've been focusing on um, in particular with cosmology and at least give you a background for um, where we stand as a field um, uh, with respect to uh, the dark matter uh, um, conundrum. So with that, um, let me begin this talk by um, by showing the uh, timeline of the history of our universe. Um, so at early times, uh, after the Big Bang, the universe was very hot, dense, um, and, and full of ionized particles. Um, Big Bang nucleosynthesis gave us our light element abundance, and um, the universe uh, continues to expand and continues to cool uh, in this time. And about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, um, neutral hydrogen forms. And what this allows is um, photons to then more or less free stream to us to be observed as um, cosmic microwave background radiation or, or the CMB. And so the CMB is, uh, um, this is uh, uh, the map of temperature and isotropies um, provided by the Planck collaboration that uh, many of you may have seen before. 
the um, the CMB is very very smooth. Um, the temperature is very uniform. Uh, reflecting the uniformity of, of the early universe. And the color variations that you see are very tiny fluctuations um, around that average temperature. And so these um, tiny fluctuations encompass a lot of physics and, and allow us to um, determine the properties of the universe um, at the time that this uh, radiation was formed. So uh, what do we know about dark matter from this cosmic microwave background? Well, we have to have a model, and in the standard cosmological model called Lambda CDM, uh, dark matter is modeled to be a cold and collisionless fluid. Um, it's, it's some matter component that is completely distinct from ordinary matter. Um, so we can take this model and we can say how well does it fit the data, and uh, the data demand that there has to be some dark matter component here. Just having baryons uh, or, or, or um, helium and hydrogen nuclei from the Big Bang and, um, and radiation is not enough, right? Moreover, there has to be about six times more dark matter than there is ordinary matter. So by far, dark matter is the dominant component of matter, uh, of the matter content of our universe. Okay, so the cosmic microwave background holds a lot of information. Um, and after uh, uh, the CMB has formed and neutral hydrogen is the dominant um, thing in the universe, the, uh, the universe undergoes this period called the dark ages where there's just not a lot of observational um, uh, uh, sources of, of light that we can actually detect directly. So, um, uh, the uh, dark ages occur, and then it's not until stars begin to form where we get this epoch called cosmic dawn, um, and, uh, and the radiation from the stars then go and reionize the universe. Now, uh, matter uh, from these early times will tend to clump uh, gravitationally, and so dark matter is going to uh, clump and start forming structures as the universe continues to expand and cool. Um, so to connect uh, the physics of, of what we know from the, uh, of the CMB, um, to attach it to structures that we see in the universe today, um, the uh, community runs, uh, has to run dark matter uh, simulations, in-body simulations. Um, this is the Millennium II simulation, and it's just showing um, the uh, dark matter only uh, structures that have formed uh, in the universe with um, initial conditions given, given from the CMB. Um, so you see this cosmic web of structures that dark matter, um, that dark matter takes on and individual um, self-gravitating clumps of dark matter um, will, uh, will form. And these are called dark matter halos and dark matter halos host galaxies. And within dark matter halos, you can have smaller halos called subhalos. Um, and so these really are um, important properties of dark matter that allow us to have a galaxy formation, right? Ordinary matter will clump together where dark matter is um, and allow us uh, uh, to have galaxies such as the Milky Way. So um, how do we know that this story is right um, from early times of the cosmic microwave background um, and, and fast forwarding with these simulations? Well, we can just observationally um, look at uh, various galaxies and just to name a couple techniques. Um, uh, there's uh, the lensing of galaxies. So this picture is showing um, a, a galaxy cluster and sources behind it are being gravitationally lensed. And you can see the lensing effects that are uh, coming into play through these arcs. Um, so this tells us that there's some form of non-luminous matter that's not absorbing light um, but is gravitationally significant in, in the way um, of these uh, of a direct line of sight to these stars. So um, in this case, uh, this, this is one piece of evidence, um, direct evidence that we have for dark matter halos. Um, more traditionally, people, um, uh, you may have heard the, the term gal uh, galactic rotation curves. Uh, so the idea here is that we can look at a galaxy and the stars that it hosts and measure how fast these stars are moving within, uh, within a galaxy. And the stars on the very outer edges of these galaxies are um, 
uh, are moving faster than would be expected given the gravitational potential well uh, uh, inferred by the luminous matter. So once again, there's some dark matter halo that's enveloping this galaxy um, that's adding more mass um, that we just can't see. Uh, that explains um, the galactic rotation curves on the outer edges of galaxies. So this is the story um, of dark matter from early times to late times, and it's obviously very a very important important component of the universe, and um, and so understanding it is uh, is something that that we very much uh, uh, want to do, and we rely on um, knowing how this. A uh, whole cosmological story happens to also understand other astrophysical and cosmological um, events. So, uh, dark matter is named dark matter for a reason. Um, when we're modeling it uh, in lambda CDM, it has to behave as a matter component. So, it behaves like you would expect ordinary matter to behave, it just can't interact with photons or with um, the other matter of the universe. So um, that leads us to the question, well, what is the identity of this matter? Is it going to be a particle that is an extension of, say, the standard model of particle physics? Um, how do we incorporate this and how do we understand what its identity is um, in a more fundamental level than, than um, just its effect uh, gravitationally? So this has um, uh, led people to, uh, to think of various possibilities. And one of the dominant uh, uh, models or paradigms for dark matter has been that of the weakly interacting massive particle, or the WIMP. Um, so the idea here is that in the early universe, and this is well before CMB has formed, um, there are standard model particles, um, there are dark matter particles that are around, and through some type of interaction, uh, you can produce dark matter from standard model particles, and you can annihilate dark matter into standard model particles. So this process you can think of as, is in equilibrium um, at early times. And um, we can track exactly how much dark matter there is um, at these very early stages. Um, and uh, specifically, we're, we're interested in what its number density is. Um, uh, Co-moving number density just means that we're neglecting the, the effects of expansion um, of a single cube growing in volume as the universe expands. So um, here uh, on the x-axis is the dark matter mass over the ambient temperature of, uh, of the standard model bath. And the temperature is essentially a proxy for how much kinetic energy there is. So as long as there's enough kinetic energy for um, these uh, presumably lighter standard model particles to be able to make heavier dark matter particles, um, uh, uh, they have to have enough energy in order to do so. So as the universe continues to cool and the temperature continues to drop, um, this process uh, will become inefficient. Um, and so dark matter will just annihilate away and become exponentially suppressed. Eventually, though, um, the expansion of the universe is going to kick in and say that um, the efficiency of dark matter annihilation is, uh, uh, cannot keep up with how fast the universe is expanding. So um, dark matter particles um, won't be able, essentially, to find one another um, at a certain point. And so this Hubble expansion halts this annihilation process and uh, you have this situation of what we call freeze out, where the dark matter number density um, gets fixed and set in place and essentially doesn't, doesn't alter anymore. Um, and this is the amount of dark matter that then can go into telling the story of the CMB and structural formation. Okay, so depending on what this annihilation cross section for dark matter is, um, this will determine where uh, exactly these, these different curves will peel off of this uh, exponential suppression and therefore tell you how much dark matter should be in the universe. Okay, so we assume we have an annihilation cross section. Um, this is average with its uh, relative velocity um, that scales as uh, the, the coupling 
of dark matter squared over the mass of dark matter squared. So this is a very simple, straightforward cross-section um, that you can, you can think of. Um, it happens that if this cross-section um, is of weak scale, or in other words, if this uh, coupling is of the, the, the weak force strength uh, in the standard model, and this mass is of weak scale masses um, in the standard model, then uh, this cross-section is just right to essentially match the observed abundance of dark matter that's, um, that, that's inferred from the CMB. So this is known as the WIMP miracle, that you don't have to add any new content other than a new particle to the standard model to get this to work. So this is a very nice um, uh, framework, uh, coincidence if you will, the, um, that, that, that weak scale forces something that's already in the standard model. But particle physics can just be used and repurposed for dark matter. So the, um, the larger uh, uh, picture which people like to place WIMPs into um, is, is supersymmetry. So in the minimal uh, supersymmetric extension to the standard model, um, we have a whole bunch of supersymmetric partners um, that are much heavier than, uh, than ordinary particles. And so you have automatic dark matter candidates. Um, the lightest supersymmetric particle will be stable. So it'll be, it needs to live, dark matter needs to live over cosmological times. And so this could be dark matter. So even more so than, than dark matter fitting into sort of weak scale physics, something that already exists, um, it can fit very easily into this framework that is designed um, really to solve a different problem in particle physics, which is the hierarchy problem. Um, so this is all working out very nicely. Um, weak scale dark matter means that the interactions are, are, very, are very weak or very small. So you have essentially the collisionless part of, of cosmological dark matter. And, and the fact that it, is, um, it, it has this uh, uh, freeze out process when it's non-relativistic gives, it, uh, uh, gives the coldness property that dark matter is also modeled to have in cosmology. So everything fits very nicely and this um, WIMP paradigm has uh, driven a lot of experimental and theoretical um, uh, development over the years. And so we can take this diagram again of standard model particles interacting with dark matter particles and come up with different search strategies to try to identify um, more carefully what dark matter could be. So you can imagine the production of dark matter would happen in colliders. Um, most notably, the, uh, the colliders at the LHC are searching for evidence of supersymmetry. You can imagine um, dark matter scattering with um, a standard model particle and be able to see that. Um, this is the program of direct detection. So the idea here is that we have um, some detector uh, filled with, say, liquid xenon. Um, and this detector is placed deep underground to try to shield from backgrounds. And uh, dark matter will come in and rarely, but um, with some rate, uh, interact with the target uh, nuclei that's in the detector. And so the experimentalist can then uh, hope to see this recoil from this interaction. And there have been many experiments that have um, uh, uh, that have searched for this or are searching for this, and I don't list them all here. I just listed um, uh, ones that have more recent uh, more recent publication dates. But the um, but the idea that that uh, dark matter could come in and scatter with our uh, uh, with our experiment um, is 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 an idea that uh, uh, that is well formed. We are living in the Milky Way, and there's a Milky Way halo. Um, and this halo consists of dark matter particles. And so we know approximate properties of, of this dark matter halo that allows us to determine what rates we can expect uh, from events like this. And with that information, we can then um, uh, uh, look for uh, specific de uh, detection events or, or rule out models of dark matter. Okay, so once again, we have this, um, 
a halo of dark matter particles that surround us in the Milky Way. Uh, so we can imagine that dark matter particles uh, uh, could annihilate and we could see the annihilation product. So this is the indirect detection of dark matter. So we have uh, uh, different uh, telescopes that we can use. So here are a couple, um, just for examples, um, that we can look for the annihilation products of dark matter um, uh, creating in some process uh, photons that can then be observed. Um, and the energy of those photons uh, uh, differ depending on the properties, exact properties of dark matter. Um, and there have been hints, right? We've been, uh, we as a community have seen anomalous events um, that have uh, given promise, but it's not conclusive. Um, for instance, the uh, Fermi telescope has seen an excess of gamma ray events um, that arise from the galactic center. Now, there are a lot of things that are happening in the galactic center, so um, disentangling ordinary astrophysics from possibly new dark matter physics um, is difficult and is an ongoing um, work. Uh, similarly, there's in the X-ray band, um, there's a 3.5 keV uh, line that's been hinted at that people have observed in, in um, the data from these telescopes. So um, these are two different uh, possibilities for the identity of dark matter. Um, nothing has been uh, uh, confirmed or, or uh, accepted by the community as saying, ah, yes, this is indeed evidence for dark matter. Um, similarly, for direct detection, um, there, there's nothing concrete. Um, Xenon 110 actually has, uh, has reported some anomalous events that, that could be attributed to um, uh, some type of dark matter, uh, but, but distinguishing that from, uh, from other possibilities is still ongoing. Um, and with colliders, uh, unfortunately, we haven't yet seen any evidence of supersymmetry. So there's nothing concrete that we have. Uh, and um, this, uh, we're, um, I think that we uh, should take a step back and look at what has led us down this path um, in terms of searching for the wind. And this is what the community is doing. They're, they're um, looking at this uh, uh, field and the, the status of uh, these WIMP searches um, and saying, okay, well, maybe we need to think of something else. Um, maybe we need to relax our assumptions about what we thought um, dark matter should be. Um, it could still be that we just need um, a little bit more sensitivity here or there and that it's right around the corner. On the other hand, we should really reassess um, why we think uh, dark matter should be a WIMP. Um, so this has led the community to think beyond WIMPs. So here I'm showing um, this, this uh, line of, of a whole range of different energies uh, which the dark matter mass um, could be. And this has a lot of information on it. I don't expect you to read it. I'm not going to going to go through it in any detail, um, but this came out of a uh, U.S. Cosmic Visions, New Ideas in Dark Matter, that um, conference that many of us participated in as a community uh, that came out a couple years ago, and I'd already say that there need to be a lot more things put on this plot, um, uh, even since 2017. So um, if we really want to now relax our assumptions about WIMPs, this opens up this wide range of possibilities. So for example, we could um, get rid of this idea that it's just this very simple extension to the standard model, um, that it needs to be connected to the weak scale and thus connected to the hierarchy problem. And so this is, um, this is the range that the standard WIMP lives in, uh, uh, in terms of its mass. Um, for, for people who are not used to thinking about uh, the masses of particles as particle physicists do, um, a GeV is about the mass of a proton. So the WIMPs were, were heavier um, and uh, in this GeV to TeV range. And when you uh, relax the constraint that it needs to be in the weak scale um, uh, regime, which is this, uh, the possibilities become quite large. Um, right. Uh, you have also this idea that that maybe dark matter isn't even particle like maybe it doesn't behave as a particle. It could be some really uh, ultra light boson. 
um, that behaves more like a wave and that its observational um, signatures will be uh, dark matter acting much more wave-like than it does particle-like. Um, it doesn't even necessarily have to be just a single particle. Um, and uh, uh, nor does it have to be a fundamental particle or even a small composite particle. It could be that dark matter consists of primordial black holes that are 30 solar masses um, that were formed uh, in the early universe, and that could be some component of dark matter. And, and even just the whole story about how the uh, WIMP so nicely freezes out with weak scale masses and couplings um, and that it was in thermal equilibrium at early times, this doesn't even necessarily have to be the case. And so you can get rid of this idea that it has to uh, be in thermal equilibrium at early times. And so once again, these ideas have led to a vast uh, number of studies by theorists and a vast number of different experimental techniques um, uh, by experimentalists that I, I just don't have the time to cover. Um, but it's very fascinating, and this is um, sort of the basis, uh, part of the basis of, of the workshop that was supposed to happen this summer. Um, once again, from the laboratory to the cosmos, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, the physics that we're searching for in very controlled environments, um, such as uh, direct detection experiments, or even with, with telescopes that are in our local vicinity uh, with indirect detection, uh, that we keep in mind that whatever we're searching for, uh, um, if we're going to call it dark matter, it needs to be connected to the dark matter that is responsible for all of this gravitational structure we have in the universe, right? So th this connection between um, particle physics at the very controlled scale needs to, um, uh, needs to uh, communicate somehow uh, with what's going on in, um, in, in cosmology and in astrophysics. Uh, so this kind of leads me to uh, this interesting aspect of using cosmological observations that we kind of took for granted um, when forming the WIMP paradigm and, and, and other assumptions that have gone into dark matter model building um, to, to really take a, a close look at what cosmology is actually telling us about dark matter. So going back to this picture um, of, of uh, the universe's timeline, um, the thing that I'll, I'll focus on right now is really understanding the physics behind the cosmic microwave background and um, uh, what, we are, uh, what information we're able to extract from it um, in terms of uh, new dark matter physics. So the... Um, the physics behind the CMB uh, is, is uh, described as, uh, as follows. Imagine, so dark matter is the majority of mass in the universe. So imagine that there's um, a little bit more dark matter in this location here, and it's going to create a gravitational potential well. Um, you could imagine that there's a clump of dark matter here, a clump of dark matter here, um, and there's less dark matter in this location. So, um, normal matter, or what I call baryons in this picture, are going to want to infall into gravitational potential wells. Um, but keep in mind that there is a lot of radiation still at this time before the CMB forms um, that is uh, going to um, interact very strongly with, with what's happening with um, these ionized particles. And so there's actually radiation pressure that's going to want to push these particles back out of their potential wells. Okay. Um, you can imagine having a system of, uh, of, of dark matter potential wells uh, at various locations, and you will get simple harmonic motion of these um, ordinary particles falling in and out of the potential wells. So at different scales, um, at different wavelengths or frequencies, this is just the Fourier space description of what's happening with the CMB. And so once neutral hydrogen forms, and suddenly the, the radiation is allowed to be released and is no longer interacting with these ionized um, particles that no longer exist, um, you, uh, uh, you freeze this picture. And what is happening at different scales at different times is, um, is, is giving you information as to how much matter was there in the universe, how much dark matter is there, how much radiation is there. Um, so this 
whole picture is, is what allows us to, to infer um, physics from, from CMB data. Okay. And so the question is, how does this picture change when you introduce non-gravitational interactions between dark matter and, and something else? Um, and so these are, these are the CMB um, uh, temperature maps. This is the temperature and polarization maps. Um, these are the data that are used um, uh, to constrain our cosmology. Um, we want to do this in a, in a statistical manner. So um, this is the uh, two-point correlation function uh, that we take for um, points that are separated um, some amount on the sky. So um, these points that are separated by one degree on the sky have a correlation of, of this amount. Um, and so you can see these oscillation effects um, in the CMB data and this underlying gray curve is, is the best fit lambda CDM model. So lambda CDM, our basic cosmology, does very well in, in describing the data. Um, and so what happens when, when we want to alter this picture um, and how well can we constrain um, uh, different models of dark matter, essentially. Um, and I want to go back to this picture of what the traditional WIMP searches are and say that I don't want to think about indirect detection and direct detection in the traditional sense. What happens um, when I place these interactions in the context of, of, um, of cosmology? What effects does, uh, uh, um, do these interactions have on the CMB? So energy injection uh, uh, does the following. Um, so here is the uh, best fit um, power spectrum that, um, or, uh, yeah, power spectrum from the, um, that I showed before uh, of the CMB. And higher multipoles L means um, smaller scales. Uh, and so when you turn on a lot of annihilation, what you get is this um, suppression that happens across almost all scales. Um, this is due to the fact that if you start injecting a, a lot of energy, like a lot of photons or, or higher energy electrons, for instance, um, into the CMB, um, that, al that allows, um, for instance, the hydrogen to be ionized. It delays um, this, uh, uh, this effect of, of neutral hydrogen forming um, to allow the, the radiation to be released. And so um, this radiation will suddenly see more um, ionized particles that it really didn't expect um, in, in the standard scenario. And so this leads to just a, a, a suppression of how correlated different points are on the sky. You can then take this information, right, and say that you can't have a cross-section that is too strong or else it's going to be very discrepant with, with what the data say. Um, and so you can look at the cross-section um, versus um, the, the dark matter mass and exclude large swaths um, of parameter space for us um, uh, with, with CMB data. And so this is um, comparing a bunch of different experiments that are in detection experiments um, and, and how the CMB uh, um, uh, competes essentially with, with those different uh, parameters. And so you can see that this is very complementary. Um, you exclude things um, by the CMB very robustly. Anything above um, uh, on the y-axis is, is, is not going to be uh, allowed at all by the CMB. And so this program has um, been known uh, within, uh, this was uh, developed by the Planck Collaboration in 2018. So um, th this effect is, is well known and these have been um, uh, studied extensively. Um, now, if you have, say, dark matter scattering with nucleons, for instance, so similar to what happens in direct detection, um, it looks very different. Uh, so if you turn on a lot of scattering, this, this suppression happens only at small scales. And the idea behind this is that um, you have these dark matter potential wells that are trying to form but these are actual particles that are residing in these wells. And so if you have any very small wells, um, dark matter interactions are, are able to uh, essentially destroy these very small structures and pre uh, prevent them from forming. So you get this 
suppression at high multiples L or, or small scales. Um, and, and that's what uh, um, happens to the CMB when you turn on um, a lot of uh, uh, scattering akin to direct detection. Um, so let me not um, dwell too much on this, uh, but the idea here is that the, the, um, uh, the data that we have from Flink, what matters most in terms of parameterizing um, different types of models, uh, of dark matter models, is um, what the dependence of the, the cross-section is between dark matter and uh, ordinary matter. Um, and what, what the dependence is uh, on the, the relative velocity between these, um, uh, between these particles um, as they scatter. So this is how you can connect um, what's going on generically in, in cosmology with individual particular models of dark matter. You just change um, this, this power of n, and it can correspond to a different particle representation. Um, so let me not go through this for the sake of for the sake of time, and just say that we can place um, uh, scattering constraints on this scenario. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on what the velocity uh, uh, dependence is, you get a different shape uh, to your constraints. So anything above these curves is ruled out by the, by the CMB, similarly here. Um, and uh, if you note that these cross sections, particularly on the left, are enormous. Okay, this is 10 to the minus 26 centimeters squared. Um, the program for direct detection, on the other hand, is probing cross sections that are 10 to the minus 44 um, centimeters squared. So this is probing a completely different region of parameter space. Um, and and this, is, this is something that we really didn't expect, right? Where we have these direct detection experiments, they're looking for very small cross sections um, because that's what the web paradigm told us. Um, but here I'm showing that the CMB can tolerate very large interactions between um, dark matter and ordinary matter, which is not at all what we typically assume dark matter properties could be. I'm not saying that dark matter has these properties, I'm saying that um, cosmological data can tolerate this. Um, so uh, let's think about very quickly and in, in for another minute or so um, about what happens to the structures then that were supposed to go on and form galaxies that could possibly be now suppressed um, from forming at all uh, um, uh, due to some, some interaction. Um, and this is, uh, uh, this is best described by what's called the matter power spectrum. Um, so this is just telling us how much um, uh, matter there is in, um, in our, in our uh, universe at different scales. And so these lines represent different types of dark matter models. Um, this uh, black line is what we assume if we just have normal standard cosmological model. Um, and this is what happens uh, when we turn on these different interactions. So we have data that will tell us um, whether or not this is, this is okay, right? In particular, um, we can say that um, similarly to the early universe where, where these interactions are going to destroy these very weakly bound structures, we can say, ah, but then these structures won't go in and form small galaxies that we see. And we can say, oh, with the galaxy surveys that we have, Let's look for very, very small galaxies. And we know that just by their very existence, we can't have too much interaction that would um, prohibit these things from forming. Um, so uh, you can take various Milky Way um, satellite galaxies, um, so subhalos in our Milky Way that, um, uh, that do exist. And by their very existence, once again, um, you can constrain uh, uh, this interaction. And so if you just look at the right plot over here, um, this is this line is the CMB line that I was showing you before. And um, these are uh, the couple lines, depending on which data set you use, um, that constrain this type of interaction um, for various dark matter masses. And so here you see um, what is constrained with direct detection experiments. This line goes down to very, very small cross sections. 
Um, so we're probing very complementary um, pieces of, uh, of parameter space. Um, this is a very generic constraint, so you can think of anything that might suppress structure at small scales. And so we can also look at different dark matter models that do similar things and apply this, um, this same type of analysis and, and constrain uh, completely unrelated models of dark matter in this manner. So um, let me just wrap up by saying that uh, there are a lot of interesting observations um, that uh, can be used to probe dark matter physics. Um, there are uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, current experiments that are ongoing and as well as uh, future experiments that will uh, uh, help us understand this dark matter problem much more. But um, the thing that uh, is important to keep in mind that on top of all of this, um, uh, these observations that are happening cosmologically and astrophysically, that there's this vast parameter space of dark matter theories. Uh, and I love this plot. This is, this is often shown um, uh, to, uh, to, to um, just uh, convey the complexity of the dark matter theory space that exists. Um, and uh, and there, there are a lot more now that uh, belong on this plot, but um, it's important to keep in mind that um, there are things that we can do both in the laboratory and with cosmology or in astrophysics um, that work hand in hand uh, to really understanding what dark matter is. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Kim. That was great. So um, I am now, let's see, I'm going to take questions. So I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce people's names, but Gennady Chitov has a question. Would you please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask? Yeah, hi, um, I have a question. If we go from, from this picture, which of course can drive everybody crazy, to the more uh, nice uh, slide you had in the beginning of your talk, where you had masses basically from like fraction of EV to, I don't know, like solar mass, whatever. Right. And uh, if, can you go to this slide, please? Yes. Um, what will be the I believe point? it was like the beginning of your talk. Yeah. I will have to. Let me actually. Well, you're looking for yeah. Uh, I, I'll just uh, state the question. Uh, from summarizing all the uh, data you have from different collaborations, etc., is it possible at this point? to put a constraint on this scale where you can say, tell us like theories, okay, don't look for this range. We know there is nothing in there. Is there right. some <laughs> safe uh, sports, bands or, or region? Yes, here, exactly. Like, yeah. is there a way to, um, to eliminate some ranges on this nice uh, scale on this diagram? Or, yeah, um, so uh, this, this scale right here, um, is uh, 10 to the 20, 10 to the minus 21 electron volts. Um, so here you're talking about uh, dark matter that is um, uh, that is a, a scalar particle. It, it behaves very wave-like, and so um, it has some natural scale. Um, it has some de Broglie wavelength um, associated with with this mass. And so you can't, you need to at least have, in a very similar way that I was talking about at the end of my talk, that you have to be able to still form very small galaxies. Um, there's a cutoff in how low you can go because um, you still need to, to be coherent. Um, yeah, uh, th th that's exactly my question. So can you put the cutoffs here while we just have this diagram in front of us? Yeah. So where where like uh, you say, okay, well, don't worry about this mass. It's it's yeah. So it's so ten ten to more about more. yeah. So about ten to the minus twenty three eV and below is is just not very is is just not viable. If it's particle dark matter and not and not some uh, uh, um, massive object like a like a black hole. No, okay, let's talk about dark matter. Then it can't be too massive. 
such that its, it's number density is, right? Because we, we know what its energy density is, right? So the higher that you make the mass, right, that, that um, uh, uh, there are going to be just fewer particles. Uh, so so if, you, if you go too high in mass, there are theoretical issues, there are, um, uh, uh, there are issues that you just need enough dark matter particles around. No, I actually was asking Thank about the operational constraints. Thank you for that question about the, the, the available mass range. That was a good one. I've got a question in the chat that I think is important, to, is, is, is another good one. So this is from David Whitman. If dark matter proton cross sections were as large as 10 to the minus 26 centimeters squared, why wouldn't laboratory experiments, in other words, direct detection experiments, already have detected that? Ah, yeah, that's a great question. So direct detection experiments rely on the factor, it, it's sort of inherent in them that, that they're looking for a very rare process to occur. Um, so if you happen to have a dark matter particle that had very strong interactions, um, then it would say, for instance, scatter in our atmosphere. It would scatter in the earth, trying to traverse the earth to actually get to the detector. So direct detection experiments have what's called a um, detection ceiling, where if you, if you have too large um, of an interaction, um, they're no longer sensitive um, because there just aren't um, dark matter particles that are able to make it to their detector to be seen. Um, so that's the reason why it wouldn't appear um, in um, direct detection experiments. Um, the mass, the sensitivity to the mass is, is important. Um, cosmology kind of doesn't care necessarily what, what mass um, you're, you're talking about as long as you're talking about cold dark matter. Um, whereas uh, the direct detection experiments need to have dark matter with a certain amount of energy to be able to um, produce enough recoil um, when it hits a when it hits an atom um, so that they can actually read that out. So uh, I have to say when I first saw your work I was very surprised because I thought I didn't hadn't occurred to me that if cross sections are large enough the particles won't even get to the direct well, they won't get to the underground labs. Right. So right. you have to look you have to do something else to look for the larger cross sections. So right. the direct detection experiments are going after WIMPs, but what you're talking about are things that are more strongly interacting than that. And yes, so yes, that, and that's what cosmology is sensitive to. Yeah, I think that's, that was a really good idea. <laughs> okay, so I see a question from Sri Kulkarni. Hi, uh, I, I'm, this is a question might annoy most of the audience. Uh, so um, when I see the plot you have on your slide five, which goes from <clears throat> it's 80 orders of magnitude in energy, okay, from uh, uh, auto electron volts to 30 solar mass black hole, um, and the possibilities. In my view, you have no theory at all. Uh, absolutely. So, as an astronomer, um, I sort of go for data as opposed to theory. And theory is fine, you know, Maxwell's equations, I get it, it works, it's got, but this, this stuff that you're describing, it just seems absolutely speculative with no forecast or no predictive or even no consequential thing. So convince me as an astronomer why the theoretical investigation of this is useful as compared to the main topic of your talk, which I do like, which is we constrain the actual phenomena, which because that, that's real, and this slide shows everything else is unreal. Yeah. So, so in terms of right, so this this um, slide here is is very um, theory centric, I would say, because you know search techniques are given one bar, <laughs> right, and we just um, and they're just listed in in the actual paper. It goes into more details about very specific things. Um, so, in terms of searching for possibilities for dark matter um, on on the mass range, maybe that's not the best way um, to to kind of hook you to this idea. Um, what I do find um, very interesting uh, from the um, astro point of view. Um, is, is this idea that uh, we should really focus on the small structures that exist in, in 
like the Milky Way or, or that exist in our universe. And so if you just think about WIMP dark matter, um, the, the theory itself, if you just think of the linear matter power spectrum is already, is, is, is only cutting off at um, very, very small structures, right? So we see things that are about, you know, 10 to the 8 solar masses, right? How can we get down to 10 to the 6? And this is, this is an interesting aspect from uh, multiple sides of astrophysics. Um, but this also can tell us that if we see a cutoff, if we see suddenly that there is no more structure and we can convince ourselves um, robustly that just no more structure exists below a certain point, I think that would be a very powerful indication that something is happening with structure formation, which is dark matter, which is the dark matter sector, right? Um, so from, from that aspect, I think that there is a way to, to look at cosmological and astrophysical data and really be able to say like, listen, I can tell you what I observe here. And now this has repercussions for a, an enormous range of, of theories that span across this entire, um, uh, entire line. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I just end quickly by saying, I understand now that the, cosmo the, the astronomers can give some clues, but if I'm a particle physicist, I won't be wasting my time working on all these theories that go 80 orders of magnitude and energy. That means we have no way to go anywhere. Yeah, I, th theoretically, there are um, certain models that are, are, are more appealing that, that um, you know, are, are based on things that we know about our standard model from the first place or, or other interesting ideas. Um, so I don't think it's just, you know, throwing darts in the dark. Um, but th this, this slide was to show that there are a lot of possibilities um, that people have uh, gravitated towards and, and WIMPs are really only this, this small portion of them. So I received a, another question in the chat, which is, um, is from Yuja Wu, who's actually my graduate student, and he wants to know, I think I can ask a question here. Since there's much less baryonic mass than dark matter, how can the baryon interactions with dark matter significantly destroy the small structures made by dark matter? So the, the, um, so in, before uh, neutral hydrogen forms, um, when you have all those oscillations that I was showing before, um, the, the ordinary matter content is very strongly coupled to what's happening with the photons, right? So as you have these acoustic oscillations, they're called, as you have these oscillations that I was showing before of the dark, um, sorry, of the uh, baryons falling in and out of the potential wells, um, radiation is doing a similar thing. And so this is how it affects what's imprinted on the CMB. This is how it affects photons. Um, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes, I think that's good. So um, you just working on Gaia data, another way to use astronomical data to go after dark matter. Yes. Yeah. So, um, okay, Netta Bacall, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, hi. Thank, thank you, Kimberly. Beautiful talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One is from the suppression on small scales. How well can one determine, or how much degeneracy is it between determining whether it's neutrinos, mass of neutrinos, which is the way that one is trying now to get mass of the neutrinos, or some other property of the dark matter uh, energy injection, or something else, maybe, uh, you know, the, the power spectrum uh, N is different than what we expect because you're just going down to the smaller scale. So how much degeneracy is there with using this small scale suppression? Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, I would say at this, at this point, a, a lot. Um, because there, there's, there's the issue of not only um, multiple types of interactions or multiple types of models um, giving very similar suppression of the matter of the linear matter power spectrum but then you have to go and evolve that and incorporate um, you know nonlinear effects and there's a lot of uncertainty in nonlinear effects we have to um, uh, uh, use simulations and uncertainties in simulations that I think it would be very hard if we did 
see a cutoff in the matter of power spectrum and we were convinced that it was really indeed a cutoff um, to then reverse that to actually comment on what type of dark matter it was. I think at that point you really have to rely on other um, uh, on other techniques to, to clue you in to break that degeneracy. Um, and there is no degeneracy with the, with the N, with the uh, a power spectrum N, power slow, at the small scale? Ah, yes. So that's also a very good point. Um, why we think, um, you, you know, the, the, the slope is just extracted, or sorry, extrapolated um, from, uh, from measurements, say, of the, at, at the CMB scales. But the CMB scales don't extend to very, very small um, uh, scales that will be relevant for, um, for, for small scale suppression. And so we're just, uh, uh, this is just an extrapolation. So that, that is also a very, very good point. It really, I think, would depend on what the cutoff, if the observed one looked like. Um, to say maybe we got something wrong versus dark matter. <laughs> Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I see a question from Erwin Shapiro. Hi, very nice talk. I had a question that's somewhat different from all the others, sure. namely going back to the original rotation curves from galaxies. Right. They seem to be flat. What is the understanding of why they are flat? Yes, yeah, so we, we would normally not, so if you just took the luminous matter um, uh, that we see and inferred how much mass there was um, in, a, in a given galaxy, right? That's not enough to support why the rotation curves that, as you get farther and farther away from the center part of the galaxy, um, have, have the velocities that, that they have. Um, and so this is, uh, this is where, where, where dark matter comes into play, that it's really, in, it, you know, encompassing an entire galaxy. So there's a mass distribution of a dark matter halo um, that's allowing it to have um, a certain amount of mass um, that's distinct from the luminous matter uh, at different radii. So um, the rotation curves can be flat because dark matter is providing enough, um, uh, enough mass to, to form that gravitational potential well. Well, that doesn't really, how shall I put it? That's a key aspect, it seems to me, of the dark matter around galaxies. And I don't see much in the way of anyone working out the details of why, of, of how it makes the galaxy curves flat. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of work in simulations and dark matter simulations that are, that are done to, um, to explain the properties of galaxies. Um, I'm not a simulation expert. Um, I can't comment that much more on this, but um, there, there, are, there are people who um, do studies of, of dark matter to, to uh, see what their effects are on, um, uh, uh, on, on, on galaxies and, and their various properties. Yeah, I think the simulations show, as you say, that the dark matter distribution it just follows the gravity and the dark matter distribution goes like out to the minus two approximately, and that will produce a flat rotation curve. It will. I, thank you for that. Um, uh, another hand that's been up for a while is Regina Demina. Hello, I'm Regina Demina from Rochester. Um, so I really like how you described the uh, WIMP miracle. And uh, um, in my opinion, so it kind of fizzled out lately. So because with the data from uh, the Hadron Collider especially. Um, so there are basically two parts in the uh, WIMP definition. So first of all, it's massive and definitely so the um, mass range so that uh, was probed by LHC is largely excluded. So the preferred mass range. So, but there is another assumption, so which is the weakly interactive. 
So this weekly interactin is kind of, I mean, it's not excluded by the cosmological and the astrophysics data, but it's not actually required at all. It mm -hmm. might as well be not weakly interacting. And then a lot of searches, so these uh, cross-sections are um, assumed. So what if it's actually not interacting with the weak force? So where, what if it's just the gravitational interaction? So in that sense, so I really like your approach so that it's, just probing different uh, strengths of the interaction. So my question is, um, so with these different strengths of the interaction, how mm -hmm. would that affect the constraints that we have from the uh, BBN? Because in my mind, so that is really a very strong argument for non-baryonic nature of the dark matter. Yes. So what is the effect there? Thank you. Um, so uh, there, are, there are a couple answers which kind of complicate the situation a little bit. Um, so certainly if there are very strong interactions um, right between dark matter and, um, uh, and ordinary matter, you, you absolutely have to worry about this, this um, idea of, of getting um, Big Bang nucleosynthesis correct. Um, namely, it's, it's quite sensitive uh, to the amount of uh, radiation there is um, at that time. Um, there uh, uh, certainly uh, you, you would have that constraint. It's a little bit more, um, I don't show those type of constraints because you, you really need to incorporate um, some, a little bit, an extra layer of model building and assume something about uh, the relativistic interaction with dark matter. Um, but the, uh, um, but yes, th this, this is absolutely something that you should be concerned about. Um, at least the scattering, uh, uh work that I did just ignored, um, the effects of annihilation because I wanted to see how much, uh, um, scattering could be tolerated. So there are certainly different eras of cosmology that it's very important to connect between, um, in order to call a model consistent. And I don't think that you can ignore that at all. Um, so so I, I took a very phenomenological approach. I wasn't thinking about any particular model. Now there is a, um, a complication of, you know, uh, maybe you have some strange reheating mechanism um, uh, at, at, at early times just before BBN. Maybe you have um, the expansion of the universe um, we assume that there's a radiation domination after inflation, um, and then it transitions to matter. You could have an epoch of early matter domination from some other new physics process um, that would change what you would infer um, the, the interaction rate to be um, to get the right relic abundance. Um, things like this, I think, are um, important to incorporate when you're um, when you're thinking about particular models. Um, but we need to get the baseline somewhere. Um, and so this is the baseline for scattering. We have a baseline for annihilation from, from cosmology, from the CMB in particular. Um, did that answer your question? <laughs> that helped my thinking. <laughs> Thanks. But, so changing directions a little bit, uh, we got a question about black holes discovered uh, via the mergers of black holes from LIGO, the gravitational rate from LIGO. And could you connect those black holes to the possibility that they are the dark matter? Yeah, so there has been um, work that um, these, these 30 solar mass black holes um, could be uh, generated as primordial black holes. And it's important that if you're going to call black holes um, dark matter that they need to not have been baryonic matter first and then later formed black holes. That's, that, that, that's, still, that's still ordinary matter, right, in terms of what the, the CMB cares about. Um, so these primordial black holes that form um, very early on uh, could, could potentially be uh, dark matter. Um, there's a large region of parameter space that it can't be all the dark matter. Um, I think there is a, there, there, there may be a little window depending on whose um, constraints you take. 
uh, uh, that allow it to be all the dark matter, but um, but at the very least, it can be some percentage. Uh, so that's that's a very viable option um, that people that people study primarily black holes. Um, so I well, we have time for one or two more questions. I see one from Ben Floyd. Hello. Um, I was wondering, you were talking about trying to uh, detect uh, structures that are like 10 to the 6 uh, solar masses or below and how that could be interesting in seeing whether dark matter interactions can form those small, large-scale structures. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 10 to the 6 solar masses is like the mass of like a globular cluster, right? And you know, how, how would you propose to detect such a small structure, especially if they live in generally larger halos, how would you be able to discriminate for that small substructure in much, in, you know, say a Milky Way, uh, Milky Way uh, sized uh, dark matter halo? That's very difficult, right? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the, um, there are studies that are looking at um, kind of probing smaller and smaller structures. Um, you can do this in uh, a number of ways. Um, for instance, you can use, um, you can use pulsar timing arrays, for instance, that um, are, you know, their, their, their main drive is understanding gravitational waves from super black hole, uh, supermassive black hole mergers. Um, but uh, for individual pulsars, if you have some amount of substructure um, that is a, a, a very small scale um, that could impact um, the the timing residual that you would sorry that you would observe from those um, uh, observations um, lensing um, so you could imagine having this uh, micro lensing is here um, uh, trying to construct what substructure looks like from from a lot of micro lensing events and so um, in in that aspect uh, I don't think that you could mistake that with a globular cluster as long as you're able to kind of rule out the globular clusters that you know exist and can see and you know where they are um, and uh, so I, I think I think that it's it's, it's very doable. It's um, uh, especially if there's a lot of substructure that we're able to see. There's not going to be just a ton of globular clusters that we haven't accounted for um, that could possibly exist at, at, at these scales um, that we're seeing in abundance. Now this is in the this is in the scenario where we definitely see a signal, and um, we definitely see structure. A whole bunch of structure at these scales, but um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's sort of the way forward. Does that? So you know, I think it's uh, it's ten after. I think it's time to let people go. Some of them are going, but I wanted to announce next week's colloquium, Tuesday, August eighteenth, will be electronic topology driven by strong correlations. Um, and that lecture will be from Silke Bülapaschen, who is at the Vienna University of Technology. So we'll see you next week. But before we go, let's give Kim a big hand of applause. That was great. Thank you.